Psalm 139, while you're turning there, I want to share something with you, very simple, yet very satisfying, that every man, woman, boy, and girl ought to know, and, and that is this, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Did you know that? Amen. Now, the longer we live, the more fearful we think it is, right? It's like, oh, it's fearful that I feel this way, or that I look this way. Uh, but you are special, and you are unique, and you are important uh, to God, and He loves you very much, and what a blessed thought. I hope that, um, I hope that you have had a chance uh, to go back and listen to some of the messages that I've preached from this psalm, because if you haven't, you're going to be behind schedule. Uh, this psalm, David takes basically, he takes a, two, a two-fold approach to this psalm. He, he looks up to God, and he's recognizing some of the attributes of God that only God could have. But then at the end of this psalm, he has an inward look as he looks at himself, and ask God to search him and to try him. And so when you look at this psalm itself, it breaks down very neatly into four little sections of six, of six verses. In the first six verses, uh, David talks about the omniscience of God, how that God is all-knowing. Now, I don't know if you've had a chance to go watch these videos. I have preached all these messages to the, uh, the other group that comes at 11. But I hope that you've watched some of them. So that you can be up to speed with us. But he, he talks about the omniscience of God in the first six verses. He says things like this. He says, God, thou hast known me. Thou hast searched me and you have known me. He's saying, God, you see right through me. You know every aspect of who I am, what I'm about. In fact, he goes on to say, you know my thoughts are far off. He said, God, there's not a, a word on my tongue, but you know it all together. You know everything about me. Last week, we talked about the omnipresence of God. As he talked about, he said, If I should ascend up into heaven, behold, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, God, you're there too. And I cannot escape your presence. He said, If I take the wings of the morning and I, and I go out of sight, God, you're there when I get there. He's saying, If I should take the sunbeams, if I could, if I could hijack a sunbeam and, and try to travel out of sight on a sunbeam, whenever I got to where I was going, God, you would be there. I can't escape you. And today he talks about the omnipotence of God. God is all-knowing. God is everywhere. All, he's ever-present. And God is all-powerful. And he talks about the power of God, namely in the creation of God and him making David and making us. He talks about God's creative powers. Now, he's going to talk about the human body. The human body is a fascinating a fascinating machine that could have only been created by an omnipotent God. Let me share some facts with you about your body that you already know. Blood vessels in the average child could stretch out over 60,000 miles. And an adult, up to maybe 100,000 miles. Can you imagine? Did you know you had that many veins in your body? Uh, messages from your nerves to your brain travel at a speed of up to 268 miles per hour. Cells in the human body are constantly being destroyed and then recreated. Now check this number out. About 300 million cells die and are replaced in the body every minute. Do you know what that means? That means about 50,000 died and replaced in the time that I told you about the 300 million. Is that not fascinating? I mean, there are things going on inside the human body that would actually scare you probably to even move if you knew what was happening inside your body. Uh, Paul Reber, a professor of psychology at Northwest University, Northwestern University, tells us that the brain's storage capacity, you're not going to believe this because you don't remember where you parked, right? The brain's storage capacity is somewhere close to around 2.5 metabytes, which is like a million gigabytes. Yet I can't remember why I walked into the room. Yeah, you had those moments. You walk in, you can't remember why you're there. You just know that you're there. According to a study conducted at the University of California, children acquire fingerprints much before they are born. In the mother's womb at about six months. Furthermore, not one single fingerprint on this earth has ever been a duplicate. Isn't that amazing to think about how God has created us? Only an omnipotent God could make us this way. Only an omniscient God could know us this way. And only a loving God would still want to be with us after doing all of that. 
I want us to look at our text today. We're going to pick up in this psalm and look at verse 13 uh, down to verse 18 very quickly. Psalm 139, verse 13. He says, For thou hast possessed my reins. Uh, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Verse 17, How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake... I am still with thee. Now, there are four thoughts I want to lay on your heart this morning from this passage of Scripture talking about how that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, talking about God's omnipotence and on, on His power. Uh, number, number one, David's recognition of God's presence. Think about David's recognition of God's presence. In verse 13, he says, For thou hast possessed my reins. And I want you to know something. God was there at the beginning. At the very beginning, in the embryonic stage, God was there with you. Now, there's an idea floating around in our world today that there are a lot of illegitimate children. Can I tell you something? There is not one illegitimate child in this world. There are only illegitimate parents. Uh, every child that's ever been created, every pregnancy, every child ever born on God's green earth was not a surprise to God, did not catch God off guard. He was there in the beginning. He was creating them and he knows them very well. On July the 3rd, 2011, I was attending a 4th of July party at Arva Looney's house. And we were grilling hamburgers and hot dogs and we were swimming and having a good time with the kids. And uh, my wife was not there. And I kept thinking, Where, where's my wife? And you know, an hour goes by and my wife still didn't show up. Uh, another hour goes by and my wife still didn't show up. And I couldn't imagine where she's at, couldn't get a hold of her. And I was starting to become very concerned. Finally, she appears and she drives up into the driveway and, uh, and she walks up and I said, where have you been? And she said, well, I've been at home trying to wrap my mind around the fact that I am pregnant and we're going to have a fourth child. Now, I want you to know something. Well, first of all, surprise. <laughs> Uh, we thought we were done. And in our minds, we were done. Uh, we didn't know uh, that we wanted another child. Uh, we were caught off guard. Well, at least, well, yeah, we were. She said I had to pick myself up off the bathroom floor, and then she had to pick me up off the pool deck. Uh, we thought we were done, but God was not surprised by this revelation. Uh, with God, there are no accidents there are only surprises. And you say, well, what's the difference? When an accident something you don't want. Uh, a surprise is getting something that you didn't know that you wanted. We didn't know that we wanted another little girl in our lives. And now, looking back, we think, what in the world would we do without sweet uh, little Emma in our lives? He says, thou hast possessed my reins. The word possess there means to acquire or gain possession. And in this case, he's gaining possession by creation. Long before that we were gods through redemption, we were gods through creation. You have possessed my reins. You have created my inward parts, my being. You have created me. And he was there. He was present in the very beginning moments of your creation. Now, you say, well, how can we be sure of that? Well... In the following verses, he uses terms like in my mother's womb. And he uses the phrase, my substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret in the lowest parts of the earth. He's talking about his mother's womb. He said, thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect. Even when I was incomplete, he was there. He saw me, he formed me, and he loved me. Now... Not only did David recognize God's presence. Notice, secondly, David's recognition of God's protection. Look at what he says in the rest of that verse. He said, Thou hast possessed my reins, and thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Now, I think that's an interesting word when he says, Thou hast covered me. He's using a word there. It's the, it's the Hebrew word, sachach, 
which means it has a couple of different meanings. Not only does it mean that he's actually covering, but if you read another version of the Bible, you might read it and it say this right here, you have knit me together in my mother's womb. He's forming me. And, and God is doing that with the child that's in the mother's womb. He is not only uh, knitting that child together, creating that child fearfully and wonderfully, might I add. Uh, he is not only doing these things, but he is covering and protecting that child in the one place that ought to be the safest place on this planet for any child, his mother's womb. It would seem that we live in a day and age where everything and everybody has protection except for an unborn child. I mean, animals are protected. I get a lot of grief because my office looks like a deer graveyard. And it does. And I, I tell them it's not a deer graveyard. It's a deer uh, monument. I'm, I'm memorializing these deer who have given their life to make my chili. I'm happy for I, I appreciate them running out in front of me at opportune times. Uh, and, and people get deeply concerned if you talk about taking an animal's life. I heard a story years ago about a man who was irritated with some rats, pack rats. If you've ever had to deal with pack rats, you'll know how irritating they are. They'll get into your car and they'll chew up the wiring on your car. You have to open your hood, leave your hood open because they don't like to be exposed. If you lived out in the country, you'd know this. But they'll eat your tomato plants too. Now you're mad, right? You didn't care about your car, but your tomato plants. I heard about a man who had some rats that were eating his tomato plants, and he created a trap, and he trapped these rats, and he killed them in the cage. This man was prosecuted and sent to prison for animal cruelty because he was killing an animal that was trapped and had no chance of escape. Well, what do we do with babies 4,000 times a day in America? We kill something that uh, ought to be in the safest place of its life that has no chance of escape and no chance of life. We live in a time where everything and everybody, trees have protection. Historical monuments have protection. Uh, water has protection, but babies don't have any protection. But the Bible says, David says uh, of God, the creator, he says, you are there with me. You have possessed my reins. You created my inmost parts, and you knit me together in my mother's womb, and you have covered me in my mother's womb. I have your protection and your, and your, your work in my life. And I want you to know something. You say, well, I, well, does this really matter to me? I want you to know that there are no accidents. You, you did not come from a primordial soup. You are not a part of the evolutionary chain uh, of the garbage that they're selling us in our public schools and our universities. You are not an accident of chemistry and billions of years. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. You were knit together in your mother's womb. And God loves you. He's created us. You know, we think about this. Uh, the reason why those abortions happen is because we don't value life. There is no sanctity of life. And the evolutionary process, the uh, evolutionary teachings, have I attribute the devaluing of human life to the evolutionary teaching. Because we're teaching people that you're not made by a creator God. As you're just an accident that's happened over billions of years and you have just managed to come in at the right time and be a part of this evolutionary process to where you have evolved to a higher state of being. You're nothing more. They teach us that you are nothing more than an animal. You're just a higher form of an animal. It's no wonder why humans behave like animals. It's no wonder why we have no value of life because of what we're being taught. Anybody that believes that, you know what they're going to do? They're going to make a monkey of themselves. Okay. Thirdly is this. I want you to look at this. Notice David's recognition of God's power. And this is what this is really all about. The omnipotence of God. Look at verses 14. Uh, he says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. The first thing that David does... Uh, in recognition of God's power is it causes him to praise God. It causes him to praise God, not reject God. 
he sees, he sees the power of God that God has made him fearfully and wonderfully. And his reaction to this is praising God for what he's done. Now, I don't, I don't think that David knew a lot about embryology. I don't think that David knew a lot about how he was created. But David knew enough to be in awe of the God who had created him, who had created him in his inward parts, in his, in his inmost parts, who had put him together and formed him and knit him. He said, I will praise you for this because I am fearfully made. Now, when David says that I was fearfully made, he's not talking about the fact that we were created to live in fear uh, but that we were created uniquely. You could say it this way, for I am uniquely and wonderfully made. There's nobody else like you. The creation of man was the crowning jewel of God's creation. It was the part that he was most loving of. It is, it is nothing like anything else. Man was created by God and he is special and he is unique and he is loved and he's not like any other part of God's creation. He created us to, to love him and commune with him. You ever thought about why God created us? I mean, some people think, well, God created us to serve him. He could have got angels to do that and do a lot better job than what we do, right? He created man to love him and to commune with him and to be with him. God wanted us to be with him and know him and to love him. And David says, I see that I am uniquely made and it causes me to praise you, God. We know that we're different because when you look in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the Bible says there, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living what? Soul. Different. Different than all the animals. Different than everything else. We're unique. Man was made special. He's not like everything else. He is a distinct creature. And then he goes on to say this. Not only are we fearfully made, but we are wonderfully made. This refers to the marvel that is the human body. I, honestly, have you ever sat down and just considered how miraculous the human body is? The fact that anybody could study the human body and see how intricate and how uh, well prepared and how neatly it is knit together and formed and how, how it operates, how it heals, and how it sustains. Anybody who really studies that with any honesty has to know that an all-powerful God created that. It could, it could not have happened. The likelihood of your human body happening by, uh, by circumstance and by chance, by random processes over billions of years, is, is less likely than a tornado going through a junkyard and creating a mansion on its way out. Less likely. There's more likely, and you think, well, I can't wait for Oklahoma's weather to create a mansion for me. Well, you have a better chance than your body being formed by accident. Consider a couple more things. I gave you some facts about the human body you already knew, but think about, think about this. Think about the hand. Consider the human hand. No other species can even begin to equal humanity's manual skills. None. The human hand is capable of both brute strength and incredible finesse. It carries out our hard labor, yet it is sensitive to the nuances of texture, and it is uh, in form, so much so that it can serve as a substitute for the eye when the eye goes out. You can use it to read Braille. The human hand is unique in having two distinctive grips. Not only can several items such as coins be held firmly in the palm with several fingers, but also simultaneously the opposite thumb, the opposing thumb, can be used to hold and turn a car key. If you want more details on this, Brother Sam did a whole series, uh, a whole lesson on the, the uniqueness of the hand. No other creature has that like that. Not, to that. not to that level. Think about the human eye. According to Versant uh, Health, your eye can focus, it focuses on 50 different objects every second. Is that amazing? The only organ more complex than the eye is your brain, which we already found out we have a lot of data capacity there. We just don't know how to use it. Your eye can distinguish approximately 10 million different colors. Uh, the colored part of your eye 
has 256 unique characteristics. You say, well, what's the big deal about that? Your fingerprint that's not like any other in the universe only has 40. Your eye is the fastest contracting muscle in your body, contracting in less than one one-hundredth of a second. The optic nerve contains more than one million nerve cells. On an on-side note, it's impossible to sneeze and keep your eyes open. Did you know that? I defy you to try it. David is saying, even then, even in my mother's womb, you were there. You were present. You were protecting me. You covered me. And then you have shown your power to me in that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm unique and I am magnificent. My body is a marvel of science that science doesn't understand. He says, when my substance was not, was not hid from thee, when I was made in secret, curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, that means incomplete. I wasn't completely formed. And, and, and today our abortion clinics will say, well, it's not a human life. It's just, it's just a substance inside of a body. It's a chemical substance that's trying to form life, but it's not a life yet. He says, listen, you saw me. Your eyes were on me when I was incomplete. And all the while you were knitting me together and making me special and unique. Cause David to praise God and stand in awe. Even in this embryonic state, God was there. He's forming you, shaping you, designing you, protecting you. Now I want you to notice one last thought here. David's recognition of God's perception. His perception of him. David said in verse 17, he said, How precious are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them? Even, even if I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. How precious. David wraps it up by acknowledging that God perceives us as precious and favored. Now, I know a lot of people struggle with this. You know, this is revolutionary news to some people because we struggle to see ourselves that way. People don't have any respect for the sanctity of life anymore. People struggle to have any love for themselves because here's what happens to us is, is we know us too. We don't know us as well as God knows us. When, when David said in verse 1, O oh Lord, thou hast searched me and you have known me, he's saying, listen, you look all the way through me, God. You have pierced through me. You see through every lie, every deception, everything I've done, everything I've thought, everything I've thought about doing, everything I've ever said, everything I've ever thought about saying, God, you have seen it all. And your thoughts are precious to me. That's an amazing thought because sometimes we can't think thoughts of ourselves like that. There are people all over the world who don't love themselves, who don't think that they're of any value, who don't think they're of any importance, who don't think they're of any uniqueness, that they're just a mass uh, of, of cells that's just going through life, is going to die and go to nothingness. And yet they don't even know that there's a God out there who, who formed them uniquely. And marvelously. And his thoughts are precious toward them. And that's a, an amazing thought for David because there was a time when David couldn't look himself in the mirror. And we probably have all been there at some point where we couldn't hardly look ourselves in the mirror. And to think that God, when he sees us, his thoughts are precious towards us. What an amazing thought. That even if nobody else wants me or loves me, even if nobody else has precious thoughts toward me, the God who created me and the God who knows me thoroughly, he still loves me and he still wants me. I read a story this week. Rubel Shelley tells of her friends, Rich and Patty White, who traveled to a third world country to adopt a little girl named Olana. After two years of effort and paperwork, the whites stood before a judge who read words 
of an official document. Here's what it said. It said, inasmuch as Alana Morgan is, an, is orphaned and unwanted by any family in this country, dot, dot, dot. Inasmuch as no citizen of this country wishes to have Alana Morgan, end quote. And you, there's the rest of that stuff, that, that recitation. When he was concluded in his statements, which gave the whites custody of Alana, the loving couple dropped to their knees, hugged their new daughter, and promised, you will never, you will never hear the word unwanted spoken of you again. When they arrived back home in Tennessee, they changed their daughter's name from Alana Morgan to Hope White. She went on to write this, you and I are unwanted orphans in, the, in a hostile universe. She writes, dearly loved, sought after, and claimed we are God's children. We have been given Christ's name as our own. We are secure because of him. On the authority of Jesus, we rest in confidence that we are more precious than we ever dreamed. Can I tell you something today that maybe you didn't know? Maybe you did. But you're precious. You're precious to God. He loved you and he created you. God doesn't create any garbage. And listen, he doesn't create anything by happenstance, by chance. God doesn't do anything without purpose or design. He doesn't move uh, like we do. He moves with great purpose. God created you. He knows you. And here's the amazing part. Not only did he create us and know us, but he still loves us. That, that, that part amazes me. I'm going to have our musicians to come. And we're going to prepare to close. Can I tell you something that might blow your mind? God does not love all of us. <gasps> you say, what did you say, Brother Matt? I'll say it again. God does not love all of us. He loves each of us tricked you, didn't I? God doesn't love populations. He loves people. God doesn't love masses. He loves me. He loves you. He created you. And he knew what he was doing. And he loves you. And he wants you. And if you don't know him as your Savior, just know this, he knows you and he wants you. You say, well, listen, I have sinned. You don't know what I've done. God does. Thou, O oh Lord, hast searched me and known me. And he still loves you. Precious are his thoughts toward you. My prayer is that everybody in this room knows Christ as their Savior. And if you do, then know how wonderful you are. Know how special you are. And know that his thoughts are precious to you. And it ought to cause us to praise him, amen? Uh, to stand in awe of what he's done. I pray that you have a close relationship with him today. Now, I don't know what your need may be. Maybe just to draw closer to the God who created you. Maybe just to get on your knees and stand in, 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 and be in awe of what he's done. Or maybe just to praise him. Maybe just to pray for someone. It could be that in your life you know people who don't know this truth. I do. I know a lot of people, personally, very personally, who don't know these truths. That they have been made by a God who loves them. And that he, he thinks they're precious. I know a lot of people who have no self-worth, no self-value. And they don't know. So maybe this, maybe you know some like that too. Maybe we ought to just pray for them. That God would reveal this truth to them through us.